Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning here to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Everett. As we begin, though, I just want to remind us. I'm sorry. <laughs> I actually just tripped getting out of the pew. But we need to remind ourselves, help. I need somebody. Help. Not just anybody. Help. You know, I need somebody. Help. Yeah, you need to help me, because next week, though, is summer air, nothing but the Beatles. And don't worry, I will not be singing. <laughs> but we have a very fun afternoon planned, September 8th, 3 p.m., right in here in the sanctuary for our Nothing But Beatles summer air concert. I hope you join us. Uh, this week, our office is closed tomorrow, an observation of Labor Day, as well as there's no uh, lunch for Pastor Allen tomorrow, and there's no Bible study today after coffee time because Steve and Judy Hammond are on vacation. We do start up our Thursday Bible study via Zoom on Thursday at 4 o'clock, and we're going to be studying the sermons and parables of Jesus over the next handful of months. Uh, Scrabble is this Wednesday, September 4th at 1 o'clock in Westminster Hall. We hope that if you're interested in playing some Scrabble, you join us. Next Sunday, if you're interested in membership or learning about the church, I hope you gather with myself and some others, some of our elders in uh, Calvin Lounge after coffee time or after worship to have a conversation about that. Also, a family friend of mine has two tickets that are non-refundable to Bouchard Gardens in Victoria for September 19th. If you'd like them, please talk with me and you can have them. We can arrange for that. Also, this is our last day of summer camp. I know. The last day of the orange suspenders for a now. They will be coming back. Uh, but I just want to say uh, for our FPCE summer camp, I am thankful for Susan Lynn, Doreen Soberg, uh, Joan Leiters, and Judy Hammond. They were our awesome cooking crew this summer. We're grateful for Barbara Barron, who led our crafts, Elizabeth Nelson, who brought the fire pit for our s'mores, and Peggy Uvelstead, uh, my faithful guitar teacher. So thank you all for that. Uh, yeah, let's give them all. We need to be excited. Last week was a fun uh, all-church picnic. We want to thank Steve and Judy Hammond, Mike and Susan Davis, David Bear Peckham, Randy Fellharbor, Marnie Larson, Teresa Good, Carrie Newpin. Uh, Kari Newman, excuse me, Joan Leiterson and Doreen Soberg for setting up and preparing for that wonderful thing. And we need to acknowledge our egg toss winners, Jacoyas and Kiana Mawadiku. Uh, thank you for leading that wonderful picnic together. <laughs> we learned something very unique. Kroger eggs did not break easily. Uh, those of us doing the egg toss, we got as far away as we could, I mean, I mean, we got like 40 feet away from each other, and I dropped the egg, the other teams dropped the egg, and they didn't break. They just rolled along the ground. I mean, Mike, you were there. I mean, I mean they just rolled around. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, mine finally, finally broke when I tossed the Vicky, and, and a tree branch hit it. Um, I think the other team felt guilty and let theirs break, and then Jacoyas and uh, Kiana, they, boy, they tossed that one really far and survived. It was fun. Also, we need to be thankful for we have some new flooring in the children's library. That's to help not just our own library, but also the uh, preschool that's uh, gearing up to uh, start on September 9th. But Bob Barron was our project man manager. Steve Ulstead, Randy Fellhaber, and Elizabeth Nelson were the work crew, and I showed up just to supervise for about 10 minutes. So uh, thank you for uh, that wonderful Wonderful work, Bob, and, and uh, facilities crew. We also need to be praying for a couple other things. Uh, that first is uh, the grandson of Mike and Martha Clemens. His name's Jade. He's in a hospital in Bellingham with kidney issues, so we pray for Jade and add him to our prayer request. And it's great to see George here. We've been praying for you, George. It's good to see you in worship today. I'm glad you're feeling better. Um, just as a note, also for those viewing specifically online or for those of you who might want to watch this service later online, um, we have been violating Facebook's copyright infringement codes for some reason. I don't know why. This means that we have not been able to take this live stream and put it on our YouTube channel. 
Uh, we're working on this, and uh, we'll keep updates as available. So it is on our Facebook uh, page, and it's live streaming for those watching. But for those who are interested to watch it on YouTube, uh, we seem to be violating copyright infringement laws so that Facebook has. So we will. It's just on Facebook, not on YouTube currently. Sorry about that. I'd like to invite Leslie uh, Sutton to come and to give us a spotlight from Presbyterian Women. Good morning. Have you ever been curious about how to get involved at our church? Maybe wonder what the facilities committee does, what worship and music does, maybe how to play a handbell? Well, on September 29th, after worship, over in Westminster Hall, we're going to have a place for everyone fair. It's sponsored by Presbyterian Women, but each committee um, and group in the church will have a table and there will be information for you to gather if you'd like to volunteer, sign up for a committee, learn how to do a new skill. Um, it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. We did this back in, through the membership committee back in 2012, and um, we thought we would resurrect it. So I hope you can join us on the 29th of September, and it will be a really fun day. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you this beautiful day? <clears throat> I'm going to take a second. <clears throat> Alan probably will say, Merlin, you don't need to. Um, but there's been something that's been on my heart for a long time. Um, it has to do with a couple things. One, how many of us over the last five, six, seven years, we've lost a spouse, we've lost a friend, D dementia and Alzheimer's have been just gone through our congregation. I was talking to Jim Coots about this last week. And it's amazing, not just that, but all the illnesses. But you know the common factor that is so wonderful is this church. I can tell you whether you're gone a week, a month, or longer. You either get a card from someone, you get a phone call, you get a text. And when we are here, we are family. And so I think through all that goes through our life, the one constant we really have is this church, this building. But it's really all of you that make it so wonderful to be here. And when you're not, you still fly like you're here. So if you are able, if you would please stand <clears throat> for the call to worship. The Lord is my chosen portion, my cup, you hold my lot. Grace lines have fallen for me, pleasant places, I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, in the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me, because right there. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to darkness or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of your life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand.
The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God's grace never changes. Therefore, we come together to confess our sins, trusting in Christ. We have already been forgiven. Merciful God, we confess that our words and our actions do always line up. We're quick to confess our faith, but slow to live it. We sing praise to your name, but we pass by those in need on the other side of the street. Change us, O oh God. By your grace, transform us. Root out our selfishness that hardens our hearts and replace it with compassion and generosity. Empower us by your spirit that we might be doers of your word and not bearers only. Give us tender hearts to receive your forgiveness and resolve to live mercifully toward others. Hear us as we turn to you. We take a moment for our silent profession confession and reflection. Today, we receive the bread of life, hear the words of eternal hope, trust in the one who hears your prayers and showers grace and forgiveness upon you. Today, free to serve God's people and to sing God's praises. Thanks be to God. Amen. May the Christ of, peace of Christ be with you.
join with me if you're able. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, please show me every day that you're teaching me your way, that you do just what you say in your time, in your time, in your time. You make all things beautiful in your time. Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. In his time. In his time. In his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time. We should know this one. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates are open wide. He will wash away my sin, let the little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Amen. Please be seated. morning our scripture comes from Exodus chapter 33 verses 7 through 23. And a note before we begin, next week we're going to head back to the lectionary texts. Uh, the lectionary is a directory of scripture passages that guides the church through God's word over a three-year period. Mark is the focus in year B, we're in year B, and so the preaching beginning next Sunday will use the readings from Mark's gospel uh, throughout and getting us to Advent. And the general title for the sermons uh, beginning next week are Mark's Curious Discipleship. 
And so we will also have, next week, we will also have a, for those who want to read uh, scripture throughout the week, we'll have a copy of the daily lectionary that you can have that will guide scripture readings every day uh, until we reach Advent. Now from Exodus, Moses, now from Exodus, we're told, now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off in the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand, each of them at the entrance of their tents, and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw that the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise and bow down, all of them, at the entrance of their tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. The Lord said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said to the Lord, if your presence will not go, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have asked. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, please show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim you, I will proclaim before you the name of the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and so mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he added, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there's a place by me where you, where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Please be seated. Wanda, it's good to see you here at Worship Again. We're grateful you're here as well. Good to see you. Uh, so, yeah, this morning, the sermon. All right, here we go. Moses has a dilemma. How will he keep the people together? And not just from the potential dangers of wandering through the wilderness, but also from the absolute disaster of failed leadership, which we read in chapter 32. We might have heard of the golden calf, but Moses experienced it. So this is a brief review, review of ex Exodus to where we are today. So we know that Moses showed up in the scene of Exodus in the very beginning as a baby, was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, led the people eventually out of Egypt. And in chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments. However, just in case Moses did not come down from the mountain with the tablets in chapter 20, he was just interpreting or translating, going between God and the people in chapter 20. In chapter 24, Moses goes up for a longer time. And in chapter 31, Moses is given two command, two tablets, excuse me, with the commandments written on both sides, carved by the finger of God. Now, while Moses was up on Mount Sinai with the Lord, receiving the commandments, the people got restless. He had been up there for like eight chapters already. And they began to wonder, why are we out here in the middle of nowhere? Were we not as good or even better in Egypt? Now, these bizarre questions deserve a whole sermon. But just in case, we remember the people demanded a God they could see. So Aaron, you know, the priestly Aaron, brother of Moses, he helps them form an image, automatically breaking the second command, but also... For some odd reason, this must have called for a party because just as Moses got the tablets from God, they hear the commotion of partying down in the valley where people are not following God. And Moses comes down the mountain. And rather than God destroy the people, Moses breaks the tablet. He tears down the golden idol, restores order through violence. And now that they're at an impasse, the Lord wants the people to move, but Moses knows there is a question of leadership. How will the people trust me if you say we're good, but I'm not certain I have a good grasp of who you are? Moses says, before I move, before I get these people up and following, I need to know that you are who you say you are. Now, for us, we might be going like, Moses, what are you talking about? God showed up to you in the burning bush. God told you Moses' his name, empowered you to return to Egypt to liberate the people, opened a path through the Red Sea, provided manna, quail, and water while in the desert, gave the people the commandments, showed up to talk with you in a pillar of cloud and smoke. Still, you want confirmation, Moses? We might think, Moses, you have it good. What's the problem? But Moses is asking what we all want to know, Lord Show me your glory. Show me that we're not just, that you're just not words from a bush, some good and practical rules to live by, and a smoky vision. And we ask that same thing. Lord, we hear scripture that you know us, that you love us. You know every breath and hair follicle of our being. Yet there are some days, some days we just need to know like, no, not just in our brains or from a flutter in our hearts, but deep in our soul, no. Like when the chips are down, when no one is following, when there is chaos, when there is doubt, when people think we're faithful, but we're dying on the inside and wonder if it's worth going on, Lord, we need to know. Moses is at this crossroads where he is wondering, if I'm not certain... If I'm not certain about you, Lord, then just, let's just stay here. It can be good here. So we'll keep the tent, we'll begin the farm, get some animals raised, and we can figure it out here on this side of the mountain. I mean, we get it. This is more than a crisis of faith. This is more than some questions or, you know, disagreement over theology. This is the morning after the dark night of the soul. The people had just built an idol I mean, after all this good stuff, people have built an idol and strayed. 
This is the morning when we wake up and see the light, and while that's encouraging, we're still weary. It's that end of summer camp, the last day. Camp has been awesome. Friends, worship, study, pool, Olympics, crafts, s'mores, ropes course, games on the green. It's been real. Too real. It's been our mountaintop retreat where we put aside our phones, we focus on the eternal, we reaffirmed our walk with Jesus. But now we got to go home. Home's not all bad. We know there will come a schedule. That schedule will involve kids and work, practices, plans, holidays, bills to pay, stuff to maintain, and lists. Wow. And in between the highs and normalcy of being away from the peaks of our summer mountaintop, there are lows. And beyond those lows, there are really lows. Yeah, those lows where we can look back and see God faithful on that mountaintop, but in the valleys where shadows creep death and despair and apathy, where we at times we live, we need to know. We're right there with you, Moses. This summer, this moment, this season has been great, but there is change coming. I mean, we get it here, right, in this church. You know, we can analyze surveys, get new opinions, shuffle the deck, shuffle the chairs on the deck, invite people to sit closer together, review our budget plan for Sunday school. You know, we can admit church life in our community has changed Remind ourselves it's not about quantity, but quality. But then there are those days when we think, man, it is just not worth it. Let's just melt down our stained glass windows and get crazy for a while. There are other days when it feels like it's not worth it to go on because just add those lists of problems in that space. It's not enough to go on because... And there are other days when we think we might not be right, we might not be the right leaders, we might not be the right combination of energy, faith, dynamic, because it feels like we're spinning our wheels, Lord, here following you, and nothing is happening. I mean, I get it. I think about this all the time. And we, like Moses, go, Lord, if we don't see you, then that's okay. Just let us be. Otherwise, we need to know your glory, your presence, your being, just for us to take the next step. And God says this weird thing, sure, let's do it. I mean, we go, I mean like, I think Moses might have been like, okay, well, I know you're not going to do it. But God says, sure, Moses, I'll do what you ask, but you just can't see my face. You can hide in this crack in the rock wall, and I will cover you so that as I pass by, you can see me, as I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on those to whom I will show mercy, just you can't see my face. And this transforms Moses. I mean, it actually does. When he comes back down off the mountain, his face is so radiant, the people can't look at him, so he has to wear a veil. And he takes the veil off and he goes back to God. So this transforms Moses. This moment gives Moses the strength to continue. Now, life was still difficult for Moses. He had to navigate the people through the desert. He had to structure the peaceful transition of leadership. He knew he was not going into the promised land. I mean, life was not peaches and cream for Moses. But Moses knew from that moment going forward. He had the understanding, the trust in the Lord, and that was enough to keep him following from the mountaintop, to keep him following to the tent entrance, to wandering that path in the desert. And this is what we, the body of Christ, the church, this is what we want. We want to have a moment when we are shielded from the full glory of God's face, but see enough of him to know that this faith, this following, giving our lives for this thing is real. If each of one of us, those seeking the Lord, could have this moment when the resurrected Jesus pops over for a visit over coffee, then maybe this puffing up of self, this fighting over nothing would cease to be a big deal because we would know. And when issues and complications, emergencies, disappointments, questions come up, we would go, remember that time? I remember that time. And we would think, I knew God just as much as God knew me. All right, I remember that time. Okay. Then I can be level-headed. 
level-headed, humble, embrace this challenge with God rather than stress over whether the Spirit is going to actually show up. Now, some of us had had moments when Jesus showed up, when we encountered Jesus in a way that meant we could not ever go back to those moments we felt like we sort of knew him. Because guess what? After Jesus actually shows up and we experience that moment, well, then we know him and we can't go back. Yet when we think about those times when we were close with God, we need to go, Pastor, Moses had the burning bush, the cloud, the tent, now the glory of God. How could he not get it? Us, on the other hand, I mean, there are so many things battling for our attention, our allegiance, our support, our time, our effort, our money, and the list keeps going. And suddenly church, daily discipleship practices, worship, community, mission, even creation just blend into a nondescript jumble, and it's hard to follow. Now, on the last day of camp when I was a staff member, my goal was always to get the kids packed, cabin cleaned, luggage to the platform, and ready for breakfast in the shortest and least amount of whiny time available. I just still do not understand how any kid, I know this is maybe boys, I would imagine girls or and women are just the same, can wear only shorts and t-shirts all week long and have a bag overflowing with stuff. To help expedite this process, I would jump into a cabin and begin rolling, stuffing, and trying to control sleeping bags because that was always the hardest thing for kids to do. And I would see that set the counselors to assist with luggage packing. And the first kids with bags ready and luggage out would be cabin sweepers. And just because they were first, they were not the last because the last had to pick up 10 to 20 significant pieces of trash from the cabin or around the area before any of us were allowed to head for breakfast. I had a plan. But what usually happened was there was one camper, the one who was slow in getting ready, the one they found a way to have everything packed, and then it was all back on the floor and the sleeping bag undone before I turned my head around to just survey the cabin. And I would get frustrated, like, how did this luggage just barf again? And I would kick into it in higher gear trying to solve this problem. And sure enough, That same camper, the one giving me an early morning migraine, was the same one who either had a parent come and pick them up, and I would hear condescending language like, stop showing me these silly crafts. Let's get in the car. It's a long drive home. Or that camper was the one still sitting there after everyone else had left. And just as we are about ready to call their adult adult contact, a car would fly in the camp, skid to a stop, the door open, the words, get in, I know I'm late, throw your luggage in the truck, let's go, before a distant, I mean, before a dust storm would cover their escape. And in fairness, maybe those families were great, but I had this feeling, as I reflect about it, I really had this feeling that they were the ones who needed to know. And maybe their lack of packing, their slowness in the morning was their call to say, I really need to know that Jesus is going home with me. They need to know that whatever trials and tribulations it is to be a young person growing up, Jesus was real and present with them. They needed to know, as all of us question, that Jesus loves them just as they are, that they are perfect in his eyes always. And in these moments, and I was slow, I get it, I'm really slow, I prayed for those campers, not just to take the highs of the mountain with them, but a full knowledge of the love of Christ, that no matter what happened when they got home, no matter their week at camp, no matter the awesome church leaders and good people in their life that they knew, they somehow really knew the glory of Christ. Moses needed to know. We need to know. All of us need to know the good news that God is gracious and merciful, that Jesus is loving and alive. The Holy Spirit is active and around us to know this to really know that we are invited to ask, to seek, to follow, to knock, to pursue Jesus, that these are worthy endeavors. And we are invited back to the mountain to return to worship, to open scripture, to be in community, and come to the Lord's table. Because when we do that, 
When we do that, we begin to know. We are invited to share with each other, to encourage, to remind ourselves and our neighbor, there was this time I knew. Because I knew, I now know, and I want you to know Jesus is with you. And that knowledge, that understanding that we are known by God and can know him, that gives us strength to keep going, to have confidence that no matter how life happens, we are loved and we are transformed because we know again and again. We know the glory of God. Amen.
Our choir reminds us that we are called to the Lord's table. This isn't a Presbyterian table. This is Jesus' table. And all are welcome. All those who put their trust and their hope in our risen Lord are welcome to come to this table. For here we are reminded that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, Jesus took the cup and he poured it and he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. And we too take these common elements of bread and the cup and we set them aside. We set them aside for that opportunity for us to get to know the life, the death, the resurrection, and the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you would come right now, that you would transform these common elements into your bread and your blood, and through the mystery of your Holy Spirit, that you would unite us into your presence so that we would know we would know that you are with us. We would know of your love that forgives us, that we would know of your grace that sets us free from sin, sets us free from expectation, sets us free from the things that weigh us down to be your children once again. We ask, Lord, that you would meet us here. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would our deacons and those who are helping to serve please come forward? In a minute, friends, we will ask you to come down to be reminded that this is the bread broken for you, to take a piece, to dip it in the cup. This is Christ's blood shed for you. If you want, there are at our two stations up front. There are also communion cups to go if you don't want to use, if you feel uncomfortable using the bread and the cup. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us all come forward and share in communion together.
Let us pray. Father, we are grateful that in this moment, you are present. We're grateful that where two or three are gathered, your spirit is among us. We ask, Lord, that you would hear our hearts. Lord, that you would hear those doubts, those concerns, the prayer requests, the joys, the hopes that we have. That we would open our lives and lay it bare before you. You already know us. So allow us not to hold back, but just to open our lives to you. And in that, Lord, we ask that you, your spirit would come and would fill our hearts. That your spirit would touch our souls and reform us and heal us, transform us into your children. And that, Lord, we would hear your voice, Jesus, reminding us to come and to follow, to come and see, to come and be your friends, to be supported and to learn. And from that, be encouraged to share your love with others. Allow us to be doers of your word, not just speakers, but allow our actions, the way we love and walk with others, the way we celebrate life, the way we hold each other's hands and mourn together. Allow that to be our witness, as we read last week, for us to be ambassadors of your good news. Allow that to be the marks by which we are known. We ask, Lord, that no matter where we are in our own walks with you, we ask, Jesus, that you would remind us that we can know you, and that you already know us, find strength and hope and grace within that. We give you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all glory and honor. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction and for the singing of the Lord's Prayer. Friends, friends, it's the last day of camp. We're going down for the mountain. <laughs> We're going down for the mountain. But know that God is always with us, and we can know him. Allow that love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us always. Amen.